Thank you very much. Um, Louis gave us 25 minutes each. That's, that's not much. Still, I want to take one minute first to um, thank V2 for hosting this event and inviting us over. And take another minute to explain the discussion you just mentioned. It's true, the very first person I pitched this project to is Alex. Um, in four years, it's also been the only person who was dead serious in his response and didn't either start laughing or start um, walking out of the room and looking cynical. This support has continued from day one and it's continuing today and I'm very grateful for that. Um, it's a pretty good as description. It's a very broad and, and wide-ranged project, yet tonight I want to try and focus on the new cities aspect of it. This is how the story started four and a half years ago, and that's what tonight maybe should be the core topic as we come almost full circle here in Rotterdam. The project started with a statement made online by the civil minister of the Minister of Civil Affairs of China, who said, let's build 400 new cities by the year 2020. I read that very short statement and immediately felt compelled to investigate. It was clear at that point already, this is probably not a real ambition. It seemed to me completely impossible. Yet China has produced the forces that made it necessary to launch such an ambitious statement. So 20 new cities each year of about 1 million people each, 400 cities. How can you manage that? How can you even start to think it? Is there a taxonomy? Is there a structure for such a project? We were insanely ambitious and started to map it out, building a taxonomy that pretty much covers everything. In hindsight, obviously um, not very effective. What was good was to try and connect what's going on on different scales and try and connect what's going on in different fields. This is what's crucial now today in China, where there's so little time to consider the future, where there's so little time to imagine an alternative reality. So a tension between manifesto and manifestation between what we see is emerging physically in, um, on a daily basis, cities growing pretty much out of nowhere, and the goals to design them, the ambition of giving quality to these new cities. In reality, in the West, the debate has um, been very lively of what we want our cities to be, but we have very little opportunity to create anything. This is pretty much the opposite. So moving our uh, team there seemed a very sort of intuitive motion of bringing the ideas to where the action is. Action at a scale of the whole of Western Europe built in 20 years. So we started thinking right at the beginning, right at the basis. What kind of cities would this be? What could it be? what would we think is necessary it should be. The social aspects, tonight um, we have a sort of a triptych. I want to talk about the ideology of these new cities. Um, we will also hear about the social aspects and the economy of it. The social aspect, predominantly, the fact that you're building cities for a new type of urbanization, a new type of urban inhabitant, migrants coming from the rural, uh, rural environments moving to the cities. And the spatial aspect, which is um, sort of has been my own fascination. Can you build a city from scratch? Can you build a city um, on top of an existing city, which is happening? Uh, how do these manifestations occur next to the existing, on top, sprawling out of, etc.? And then how can these ambitions be aligned with the global necessity to make cities that are more sustainable, energy efficient? Then there's a historic aspect of what would happen with the previous. Ultimately, 
you have a condition that can be divided in a sort of a doom or business as usual scenario and maybe an alternative path, a dream scenario. Because what many people seem to forget, we in the West, uh, especially architects and planners, like to project our utopias on top of this seemingly endless and empty map of China. And the same goes for Chinese planners who treat existing cities as potential tabula rasa just waiting to be demolished. In reality, China is halfway done. Since 78, the open door policy, things have been booming and we can roughly assume that there's another 30 years of progress. We are halfway. And this halfway marker requires a totally different approach, a much more, I will argue, organic approach. In any case, there's a lot to think about. The future of the city can be, and China proves must be, readdressed. We can start thinking from the very beginning. Is the city man's greatest invention, or is it a mere byproduct of civilization? Before answering that, some general background. We all know where the action is when it comes to urban expansion, urbanization. It's at the moment in Asia, and it's still, it's gonna be there for the next decades. If you look at China, roughly the size of Beijing is added each year. Beijing now 18 million plus. The forces behind that still population growth, even though um, the one-child policy has been put in place and is still, though less and less strong, it's still in place. And secondly, a migration to um, the urban areas and an urbanization of the rural areas. And then dealing with numbers has been a particularly um, tricky business. There's very little to hold on to. There's very little solid ground when talking and thinking about China. This diagram shows if you project all the, um, the ideas, the, the projections for 2020 next to each other of the population growth, they are so far apart, running around from 1.35 billion all the way to already today 2 billion. Very hard to put a finger on. These are all official statistics by fairly recognized bodies. So what we've done is made an overall average starting at 1.55 billion. That's the amount of people that is putting pressure on the urban space in China. Pressure that takes shape in expansion of floor space per capita, larger homes, more roads, more everything. And then a move within China. There is still today, both in the West and in, in, in Asia, this idea that migration is pretty linear, that migration is from the rural areas to the countryside, to the coast. In reality, it's multidirectional. It's going from everywhere to everywhere, from rural to rural, etc. It's also temporary, rollover migration. People move to the cities, make their money, move back again. And all the policies in place today, we will argue in the book, are actually encouraging this temporary condition. If you look at um, top-down settlements, the government's incentives, high-tech development zones and such, are scattered and, um, it makes sense, built fairly far outside of the urban cores. But also, bottom-up is happening outside the urban cores. So even though there is a strong incentive to urbanize, in reality, the real urbanization is taking place below the radar. Um, this diagram is maybe the best approximation we could come up with of what we've been calling scattered urban expansion. It mapped all the forces in place today that all contribute to this fragmentation, to this um, sort of completely new and radical form of uh, urbanization. This is important because when thinking and talking about new cities, we have to acknowledge that a lot of new cities are occurring even though we can't pin them down. 
In fact, in China, the last um, two and a half decades, about 23 new cities on average each year were produced. This is a trend that continued. Actually, today, the rate of urbanization is still very strong. But we can't count any new cities. The policies have been tweaked that officially there are no or sometimes one new city each year. This is because it's very expensive for China to acknowledge new cities. New cities come with um, rights for its citizens that cost money in terms of social welfare and such. The move, the real move, is taking place somewhere else. There's a, a fear that dominates the thinking and, and planning today, a fear of keeping migrants away from the larger cities. This is understandable if you think of the fact that just about any developing nation today is facing slums. China, as one of the biggest, or the biggest, developing nation in the world, has officially no slums. The slums are happening just outside the periphery, outside the vision, below the radar. And this slum formation, or at least um, fragmented urbanization, is occurring on the smallest level of settlements, the smallest scale of cities. This is very unfortunate because these are also the least efficient in terms of space use. There is, however, a concentration. If you're talking about density, a sort of a sensible start for a project such as this, and you look at the map, you come to a conclusion that actually everything is happening on one third of the map of China. Everything in terms of economy, agriculture, uh, migration, uh, road production, etc. 96% of what we have called everything in uh, China happens on only this small area, what we've been calling the people's urbanity of China. That immediately demands us to rethink the average densities. This is the real urban China. This is an area that can compete with, for instance, Holland in terms of average density, compete with India, Bangladesh, the densest large areas in the world. And within that area, there's other competing forces. Historically, it's understandable that the richest agricultural lands producing the most food are also the areas that are expanding and urbanizing the fastest. These, if you sort of put these maps on top of each other, start competing immediately for space. So China, so eager to be independent, if you will, a global, well-connected fortress, is increasingly um, unable to be self-sustaining. And this urbanization wouldn't be so dramatic if it would happen in a really compact, streamlined form. We've mapped some possible scenarios. This, uh, which I really like, is LA density. Not an unlikely scenario. It's a massive circle. We like using um, American references because of the scale of the country and also the Chinese dream started off as a reference to the American dream a dream based on individualization, consumer goods and uh, consumption increasing, and a flight to the suburbs. In reality, it's not a nice clean circle, which is very unfortunate. It's a sort of splatter pattern, if you will. But in that splatter pattern, we can still trace a concentration within a concentration. We've mapped, uh, did a similar exercise for the area what we've been calling Jinghu, basically between Shanghai, Xi'an, and Beijing. That's um, this black area. There, the concentrations are really serious. In fact, they are equivalent to a mid-sized American town. The only difference, we're talking about two times the size of France. So one continuously urbanized region a region, if you start 
zooming in, you understand that nobody has been able to acknowledge this massive migration internally and massive urbanization within this area. It's happening at a micro level. These are some random uh, moments on the satellite image. If you look at this, the uh, smallest level that Google Earth has to offer, you can see the villages literally growing together, patching together in an almost continuous fashion. At that point, we tried within the project to answer every research with one proposal. A proposal that ran along, let's say, a doom or a business as usual and a dream scenario. So if this is the current where you can trace, <coughs> where you can trace this sort of urban ridge in the center um, as the, the most dense area within Jinghu, you um, still have a decent amount of green space left. However, if we project the growth until 2020 along the business as usual scenario, this is all but gone, a sort of mush emerges. But the time is still available, even though you know, over the period of time we wrote this book, four and a half years, things have already changed as well. You can start using infrastructure, in this case a sort of a double loop, a train track on one hand and a sort of road network on the other, to start streamlining and condensifying this urbanization, creating a sort of a new metropolis. So our very first project forced us to rethink anything and everything we thought we knew about cities. We were looking for 400 new cities and somehow how to place them on the map of China, how to come up with a formula that allowed China to give direction to this ambitious plan. In reality, what we found was one true megalopolis of over 400 million people already today. That brings us closer to answering the question, is the city our greatest invention or a mere byproduct of civilization? A simple answer would be this. If you could redesign Beijing as it has done over the last eight years, looking um, up to the Olympics, you could choose any of these density curves. You can say, well, I want to live in Berlin, or I want to recreate New York or Shanghai, very dense, very nice, compact, fairly livable city. Or, well, nobody actually wants to live in Jakarta, but you could recreate these conditions. Beijing at hyper speed reveals that this is an impossibility. It reveals, and it's kind of nice for researchers, that there's only two, in that sense, fairly um, easy to understand forces are predominantly at play, the government and the developer. And in China, these two parties are often the same. This is, at the end of the day, the reason that China has been able to grow so fast. Developer and, and government can be understood as two parties with one hat, one party with two hats, being able to switch sides almost instantly. So as we zoom in on the map that's emerging, and you have to warn me of my time, um, we can understand, for instance, the CBD in Beijing as this sort of checkmate real estate condition where the government slices up areas and gives it to specific developers who then retreat and in perfect anonymity um, and seclusion built up this single lot, making sure nobody knows what's happening because the market forces are so fierce he could lose his, his project almost right there and then. What you get is that these plots are competing without knowing what the other is doing. So they could both be building uh, parking lots or swimming pools is maybe the soup du jour. There's no connection, there's no balance. Zooming in further, the same can be said of the residential realm. Um, very, very bluntly, you could argue what's happening is that the previous communist era that produced all the six-story walk-ups 
are simply being extruded today. So um, this is a project, it's hard to see, but a project of a domino blocks which looks exactly like the residential block, um, which then, as the market takes over in China, are being extruded and the dangers of these blocks tumbling over increases. So very slick, modern, fairly beautiful environments are being produced. At least slick in terms of they look and feel very smooth in reference to their predecessors. You have all the amenities you didn't have before, like some public park, a parking, etc., running water. However, that almost takes away the opportunity for the Chinese consumer to address these critically. They look, feel, but as we're arguing, they really don't operate any differently than their predecessors. The result is a radically new form of urbanization. The patchwork of these insular moments can only be connected with highways. There's nothing that really holds it together. In fact, urbanization, the profession of urban planning has been eradicated. The skill of architecture has been expanded to overtake urban planning just about altogether. In, um, on the social level, these gated communities have trans transformed Beijing from this completely communal map where everybody's living in the same context earning the same amount or just about nothing to a completely stratified environment of specific moments. This stratification even happens at block level and even within one single block. So slick cities look smooth but fail to operate in any efficient manner. Inaccessibility is increasing. Monosprawl, what we've been calling monosprawl, uh, proliferation of monofunctional areas is taking place and social lockdown. So you can understand current Beijing planning as moving people out and empty spaces in. If you're facing such a monstrous big city as Beijing with so much congestion, it's a very intuitive step to say, okay, we have to take the people out the centers, the dances, let's move them out to the suburbs. And then we're going to replace that with big archeries, plazas, and such. That's going to be the case for, we are in the dotted line now, for the expansion of Beijing over the next 12 years. Can we still take control over this process? It looks as though you're in control. Five minutes as though you're in control, as though you can design every detail in the Chinese city, literally from the wall to the doorknob. But as you're patching these perfectly designed microcosms on the map, and you zoom out, looking at the larger structure, you see a much more organic entity forming. In reality, China is running after its own problem. It's post-planning. We suggested maybe there is a model that can be formulated that takes hold of this process and actually takes advantage of the fact that so many people are still moving to the suburbs. These migrants are then becoming the core of a new quality to give density and direction to these fragmented peripheral areas. This is possible if you understand density as very much a physical thing. Density has a place, it has a direction, it affects its environment and is, infected, is affected by its environment. In that, at that point, you can suggest, you can start shaping and coordinating, giving direction to this organic quality of density. And within the really modeled, if you look at the, the scattered urban planning map, really modeled context, we produced a really blunt model in response. A model that suggests dynamic density has to start giving a streamlined, compact quality at every level, from at the center, the metropolis, but equally all the way down 
to the smaller villages. This is obvious when you think about energy. A very old, recently updated, um, famous map showing the relation between the density of a city and its efficiency in terms of energy use. Atlanta being the least efficient, top left, and Hong Kong being almost the most efficient, bottom right. But it's important on so many other levels. The way the city works on a social level, and in that sense, the way the city produces a type of consumer, a type of citizen. We're suggesting you can actually, if you acknowledge that you can't stop or reduce uh, the amount of consumption, you can try and create green consumers. This is a map of Beijing showing um, an environment that's been almost transformed overnight from a very fine grain hutong or small alley fabric into this um, mega archery. A sort of a self-fulfilling prophecy because this was built at a time when there were almost no cars. Now this junction with it, every other junction in Beijing is completely congested. So as we um, try and speed up and click through the slides, you see that Beijing has lost its quality as a residential environment. The real Beijing, in that sense, as we knew it, is gone. Instead, highways at a scale that you can really, you should understand it as suffocating the city. This is a model uh, we built that reveals if you only look at the ring roads, two to six in Beijing, and would m wrap them around the forbidden city at the exact same scale, you get this kind of a bowl, the red box in the center being the forbidden city. At that point, it becomes, sorry, it becomes clear that the city and road construction is in a permanent battle. Every time you want to expand the city and serve it with more roads, you need more urban service to serve these roads. It's a catch-22. So Beijing, the once beautiful, maybe best example of a monocentric city in the world with pure ring development is now naturally moving to a polycentric model. And then in reality, the government suggests we want to aim for a polycentric model. We want to recreate that. That reality is there. This is a map of Beijing today. A map that shows that already one third of the people is living far beyond any of the maps you can buy in any shop. It's living beyond the sixth ring in this almost amorphous object. If you then start projecting utopias on the map, such as the utopia of building the world's largest track-based infrastructure, rail and subway, if you look at it at the same scale of the existing map today, you see that these people can't be served. This is one example we introduce of how we have to start coming to terms with the city leading the way in its development, and we can only try and give direction as opposed to the other way around. Um, that's one example of about eight I wanted to present today, but I'm going to give the floor to the next speaker, which is Martijn de Waal. Thank you very much. <laughs>